Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we are discussing the tragic and preventable murder of Riley Whitelaw, who was brutally killed by her stalker and co-worker at a Walgreens, a company that made zero effort to protect her. Let's get into it. Just a short disclaimer before we get started, though most of the information is coming from police reports, no one in this case has been convicted yet, and therefore, allegations. Nestled at the base of Pikes Peak, a scenic summit in the Rocky Mountains is Colorado Springs. It's described as a big city with a small town feel, but the recent murder of 17-year-old Riley Whitelaw has shaken this Midwestern community to its core. The man accused of murdering a 17-year-old co-worker at a Colorado Springs drugstore made his first court appearance today. Joshua Johnson faces first-degree murder charges after allegedly killing the Academy District 20 student in a Walgreens break room. 13 investigates learned in court that the 28-year-old suspect was on probation at the time police say he murdered Riley Whitelaw. It was an unsupervised 12-month probation for a traffic offense he pleaded guilty to last year. Arrest documents describe a horrific, bloody scene inside that store, a gruesome killing that allegedly took place with customers shopping just outside. Riley was a high school student working part-time at the local Walgreens. She was a talented student that kept a super busy schedule. When she wasn't in class, she was a school color guard member and even found time to volunteer at a local animal shelter. She was described as a creative person that used several artistic outlets to express herself. She loved painting, writing, dancing, and playing guitar. Not only was she accomplished and bright, but Riley was described as empathetic, compassionate, and wise beyond her years. Riley was tragically robbed of her bright future when she was murdered on June 11th. The story of that day actually began one year earlier, when Riley was only 16 years old and started working a couple days a week at her local Walgreens. Riley was said to have liked her job there and got along with her co-workers. However, Riley went to her management team and said that one co-worker was making her uncomfortable, 28-year-old Joshua Johnson. She said that Johnson was making several unwanted advances towards her, and she was concerned and wanted it to stop. The store manager, Justin Zunino, told her that he would take the complaint seriously, but only spoke to Johnson, asking him to act professional in the workplace. We're talking about a grown man making unwanted sexual advances towards a minor and all that happened is he was asked politely to stop. No additional precautions were taken to protect Riley. There were no disciplinary actions taken, and Riley was forced to continue working shifts with a man who would continue to harass her. Over the next nine months, Riley continued working at the store, and it is unclear if the behavior continued from Johnson or if management wasn't doing anything about it. There allegedly weren't any additional former complaints for a while. I remember when I was 18 and working my first full-time job. It was a job that I worked entirely with much older adults. Almost all of them were men. I had endured months of sexual harassment from a couple of guys that I worked with. When I went to my male manager, he laughed and said I was being sensitive and told me to ignore it. It kept happening, and when I approached the owner about what was happening, all of a sudden, my manager was pissed off at me because I'd gotten him in trouble. After that, my manager basically told all of my coworkers I had tattled on them and I was ruining all the fun. I was essentially bullied relentlessly after that. I was put on shitty shifts, I had my hours cut, and my manager refused to sign off on reporting my hours that I needed for my apprenticeship. I know that my experience is not a unique one. Reporting sexual harassment in any workplace is terrifying. It took me weeks to build up the courage to say something, and in the end, it made things ten times worse. The bullying for reporting the incident was way worse than the initial harassment. I don't know if this happened to Riley exactly, but I know what happens in workplaces. People gossip, and people are mean. 
In March of 2022, Riley's boyfriend Jacob began working at the same Walgreens as Riley. It was at this point that things began to escalate. Crystal Eichmiel, another manager at the store, began noticing that Johnson seemed to be acting increasingly jealous. But again, nothing was done about it. There was zero effort made by management to make any changes or protections in place. In late May, Riley approached management again and reported Johnson for unwanted advances that were making her uncomfortable. She specifically stated that things were at the worst when they worked shifts together. Riley asked to not be scheduled with Johnson. It seemed to be a very reasonable request if they weren't willing to do anything else. She made the complaint with the store manager, Justin Zunino. As was seen with the first complaint, no action was taken. When Riley asked not to be scheduled with Johnson, she was told that they could only accommodate her request by cutting her hours, and it wasn't possible to schedule them separately. The harassment was so unbearable that Riley accepted the accommodation, but eventually approached management again and that she said she basically begged for more hours. Zunino said he could give her more hours, but she would need to work with Johnson and just deal with it. Riley accepted the schedule change and went back to working night shifts with Johnson. On June 11th, 2022, Riley was working the same shift as Johnson. She left for her 30-minute break around 5.30 p.m. She was working a Saturday, so she was likely midway through her shift. For anyone unfamiliar with corporate retail structure, breaks are usually staggered in such a way that they shouldn't disrupt business service. These breaks are usually all pre-planned out and on your schedule, so you know what time approximately you're going to be taking your break. And if you're even a minute late coming back from your break, your manager usually knows about it because that means your coworker can't go on their break and it has a domino effect for the rest of the breaks that day. So to me, this next part makes no sense. Crystal Eichmill noticed that Riley didn't return from her break around 6 p.m. and called Justin Zunino to come back to the store. He quickly returned a few minutes later. Ishmael claimed to have looked all over the store for Riley and had basically assumed she had abandoned her shift, which is a term used for people who leave mid-shift. Zunino decides to check the store's security footage to see if Riley left the building, but instead he finds something much more disturbing. In the video, Zunino saw Joshua Johnson carefully stacking boxes on top of one another until they completely cover their surveillance camera that faced the staff break room, as if he was trying to prevent people from seeing the actions he was about to take. He noted the time when Johnson had started doing this, and it was hours before Riley's disappearance, near the start of his shift. Zunino also noticed that when he returned to the store, someone had taped over the windows to the break room with paper, so that you couldn't directly see inside the break room. Additionally, he noticed a restroom closed sign taped over the door. This was the public washroom, and it was unusual to have that sign up while the store was still open. At the time, he hadn't really thought anything of it or didn't really think it was super important, but while he was watching Johnson cover the cameras, he knew something very wrong had happened. Finally, Zunino went to the break room, being the first person to go there since Riley went on break. Apparently, no one had thought to check the break room when they were searching the whole store for Riley. When he opened the door, he immediately saw Riley on the floor and said that there was blood everywhere. Completely upset and in shock, he did not enter the room and ran out to call 911 at 6.55 p.m. Meanwhile, Crystal Ishmael said that she'd been looking around the store for Riley when she noticed a strong odor of bleach coming from the dumpster area. When she attempted to investigate further, a male voice called back and said not to open it or come closer because he he was changing. She quickly went to ask Zanino for help, but no one was there when she returned. All that was present was a completely empty bottle of bleach on the ground. Police officers arrived on the scene at 7.02 p.m. According to the police affidavit, Riley had suffered significant trauma to her neck area, and there was a lot of blood around her head and on the floor, 
and other stains on the floor, cabinets, and counter. Zunino and Ishmael relayed the information to the police about everything they had seen in the store that day and the camera footage. They also told officers about Johnson's jealous behavior and advances towards the victim. Joshua Johnson was already the prime suspect, but he was nowhere to be found. Officers began taking statements from customers and co-workers and discovered at approximately 5.44 p.m., a customer in the store was shopping in the deodorant aisle when she heard screaming and a slamming noise like a door or locker. Nervous yet unsure of exactly what she'd heard, the lady simply finished her purchase and left the store, only reporting what she had heard after the incidents of the day came to light. But she wasn't the only one who heard that. Several other reports from customers and co-workers reported hearing similar noises, but no one investigated, placing the time of the attack at 5.44 p.m. And even more shocking that no one checked the staff area for over an hour. I have been a manager for many years, and if someone was ever late coming back from break, the first place I would check would be the staff room. Law enforcement finally found Johnson the following day, walking on Interstate 95 near Trinidad, Colorado, over 100 miles from where the crime had occurred. According to the officers who picked him up, Johnson had scratch marks on his face and hands, consistent with defensive wounds. Johnson was promptly picked up without incident and brought in for questioning. He admitted to officers that he'd previously had a crush on Riley, but had not been interested lately because he was in a relationship with Crystal Eichmill. While there is uncertainty as to whether his claim is true, Crystal certainly did not mention this to police, nor did any of the other interviewees. So it's possible Johnson lied about his involvement with her. Johnson also made the improbable claim that he'd been in the break room after Riley had been killed and slipped and fell in her blood but did not call police and decided to clean himself up. He said that he walked out of the store, went home, and changed his clothes. However, he denied stacking the boxes to cover the camera, despite the clear evidence of this action being seen on video. Joshua Johnson was officially arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He's being held without bail while he waits trial. The investigation is ongoing, Johnson will next be in court on August 26th. While Joshua Johnson is the top suspect and the likely murderer of Riley, news outlets have speculated as to whether he is the only party to blame for Riley's death. Walgreens and her managers there should have done more to protect Riley. Sexual harassment reports should have been taken seriously and inappropriate behavior like what Johnson exhibited, should not have been tolerated in the workplace. Riley's safety and well-being were not prioritized by her workplace, and this negligence contributed to her death. Walgreens has not made a public statement about Riley's murder, though they did opt to say that they were providing grief counseling to employees and have closed the store, which, as of recording, remains closed. It is unclear if any legal action will be taken against the management of the store, or if there will be any broader actions taken by the company to prevent this from happening again. Riley's family has set up a GoFundMe to establish a scholarship in Riley's name. They are hopeful there is swift justice and appreciate the outpouring of support they have received from the community and abroad. We have some new developments in the death of a high school student at a local Walgreens. People are raising money in honor of 17-year-old Riley Whitelaw. A GoFundMe has been made. Organizers say they hope to put the money raised toward a scholarship fund in her name and possibly toward genetics research, which they say that Riley enjoyed studying. As of tonight, they've gathered almost $30,000. 11 News reporter Aaron Vitito joins us live from where this all started. Aaron, the man charged in this murder was in court today. Yes, he was, Lindsay. 28-year-old Joshua Johnson was formally charged with first-degree murder today when he first appeared in front of a judge. Now, Riley's body was found in the break room of this Walgreens on the corner of Centennial and Vindicator. Johnson was later found and arrested near Walsenburg, almost 100 miles away from the scene. 
According to court papers obtained by 11 News, Riley and Johnson had both worked at this Walgreens. The papers say that managers told police she had complained about Johnson making her uncomfortable with unwanted advances nearly a year earlier. She reportedly had asked them to avoid scheduling the two together, but when she had asked for more hours, the store told her that this would require working with Johnson. We reached out to Walgreens about this, but they have since refused to comment. They do say, though, that they are offering grief counseling and support services for their staff members. I also reached out asking them when they're expecting this store to reopen, and they tell me that it will remain closed. Now, as of right now, Johnson is being held without bond in the El Paso County Jail. He's expected back in court in August. We'll be there, and we will, of course, keep you updated with the latest. A funeral is also being held for Riley this Thursday. Reporting live in Colorado Springs, Aaron Vitito, KKTV 11 News. All right, Aaron, thank you. Colorado Springs Police Department also encourages anyone with information about this case to call them or make anonymous reports with Crime Stoppers. Let me know in the comments down below if you want me to cover the Joshua Johnson trial. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like this content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. And also a friendly reminder, we have channel membership or Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content.